those legendary UNLV Runner Rebel teams of the early 90s. Welcome back to another episode of 68 Shining Moments. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Greg Anthony, a member of those early 90s Running Rebels teams. Greg, what's going on, man? Thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, that time of year, uh, I think we all get a little excited as March Madness rolls around. And actually, it's just nice to have March Madness after what we went through last year. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, heading into that 1989-1990 season, you guys were coming off a year where uh, you won 29 games. You made it to the Elite Eight. Um, you beat number one Arizona in the process. Uh, and you brought everybody back. I'm assuming heading into that season, you guys knew you had a chance to be something pretty special. Yeah, yeah, we, we knew we'd be a good team, uh, probably exceeded expectations uh, that year uh, prior to winning the national championship. And as you mentioned, bringing everybody back. But more importantly, we also uh, signed a guy by the name of Larry Johnson who wasn't that bad. And so to bring him into the fold, uh, oftentimes it's, you know, it's never guaranteed that a, a really good team can, you know, consume a player of that magnitude and everybody still be able to play at a high level. But you know, after a few bumps in the road early in that season, we really kind of hit our groove there and, and played some great basketball. And obviously we were able to go on and, and win a national championship. So when, when Larry got there, I mean, he, he was a Juco guy, but the Jukes were different. Yeah. Like he was a McDonald's all American. He was national player of the year for the NJCAA two years in a row. He was a guy that people thought could be a first round pick if he just went pro at a junior college. So I want to know your reaction the first time that you saw him play, where you're like, oh, okay, that that's why he's yeah. getting it. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, Larry, to your point, was that good, if, if not better. And, it, and, you know, I had been there a couple of years, and every year Coach Tark would always talk about guys he was recruiting and bringing in and telling us how great they were and this, that, and the other. And then you go play pickup, and, you know, obviously we were pretty good as well. And so you'd be like, yeah, yeah they, I mean, they're okay. You know, they, they were decent, but, I, like – nothing that we hadn't seen before. Uh, and, you know, again, with same spiel with Larry. And then the first time we played pickup, you saw he was different. Like he just could do things that I had never seen other guys do. Uh, when you looked at his size, his athleticism, uh, his hands, uh, just his ability to play the game was at a level that really none of us had seen. And on top of that, he was a great guy, like an awesome teammate, uh, and I think that's really why it worked. As much as the talent was important, the person was more important. The teammate was more important. And, and he really just meshed well with the guys. And I remember Stacy talking about it when he first got there. Stacy was like, you know, I didn't even want to like because Stacy was considered our best player. Uh, and, you know, de facto lottery pick moving forward. And, and so he had every reason to not like Larry. And he said, you know, but I couldn't help but like him. You know, and, and they became, you know, just great friends and uh, as we all did. And so it, it was a really cool experience. And, and for us as players to finally see one of those guys or be able to play with one of those guys. You know, I'd played on junior Olympic teams and I'd been able to play with some great players. Uh, but but he was, I, I thought, the best. He and, and maybe Sean Kemp was in that category of guys who I'd actually played with. Uh, that had a an opportunity to be one of those greats at the next level. So you guys go out and you had a little bit of a slow start to the season. I think you lost two of your first five games. One of them was in New York. One of them was at Oklahoma. But by the time we get to February, you're just in cruise control. You won 21 of your last 22 games, stormed through the Big West tournament, rolled through the, uh, through, through the NCAA tournament, beat Duke by 30 in the national title game. Mm -hmm. I want to know – what that city was like, what Vegas was like when you guys came back as national champs, having beat Duke by 30. Like, are you, are you celebrities? Are you signing autographs everywhere you go? Are people taking pictures with you? Are you getting bottle service at every club? And in, in like, <laughs> yeah, well, like first, came back? first of all, it was like that prior to winning the <laughs> national championship from the standpoint, like, you know, running rebels and coach chart, that was like the biggest game in the biggest thing in, in town. Like we had a, our, our Gucci row, which was the front row at the Thomas and Mac and a who's who of the celebrities would sit there. And, you know, I have all these great photos of, you know, MC hammer and Vander Holyfield, Mike Tyson, all these guys that would come to the games, Bill Cosby. And then afterwards they come back in the locker room and hang out. And so like they were as enamored with us as we were with them. Uh, and so you had that. I grew up in Las Vegas. And so Coach Tark 
had always been a, a legend there. Remember, this is a small, this is a small town, basically, when I was a kid. And so we didn't have a lot outside of the strip and Tark, you know, and, and so there were no pro sports. Uh, and that was it, man. And so he had always had really good teams. And so the program had great panage within that city. Uh, and then it became more of a national brand once we obviously started having the success and, and winning the national championship. So, yeah, it was it was, you know, I don't want to say party central, but absolutely it went to a whole nother level uh, after winning it. And honestly, it was in Denver the night we won it. Like when we got back to the hotel, I mean, you could not see anything but people. It was an unbelievable sight. I'd never seen anything like that. Um, but the entire, it felt like the entire city of Las Vegas was there celebrating with us. And then obviously you get back, you have your parade and you have all these incredible things. And not to mention, basically we were all coming back. So mm -hmm. that speculation about having a chance to win another one also kind of fueled, uh, the legend, if you will. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty wild ride. Before we continue that interview, I just have to let you guys know that it is that time of year again. We have waited two years for this moment, and it is finally here. March's biggest tournament is back. Gonzaga's getting ready to run the table. Slippers are being fit as we speak. And our partners over at DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, are putting our listeners at the center of the action. How? If you bet $4 on an underdog in a select game this week and that underdog wins, you win $256. That's right, $256. Here's how it works. You download the app now. You use the promo code FIELD68 when you sign up. Scroll through the list of select underdogs, bet $4 on one of them to win, and cash $256 when they do. There is no better way for you to put your college hoops knowledge to the test, and then to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. It's safe, it's secure, it's reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. I know this because I use them. So remember, the code is FIELD68. That's FIELD68 to turn $4 into $256. For a limited time only, must be 21 years or older. Restrictions apply. Go to DraftKings.com for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. So that offseason is when things got really crazy because there was the, uh, the NCAA finally came out with their violations from something that happened 13 years earlier with Coach Tark. Uh, and I think that they initially ruled that you guys were going to be ineligible from the postseason that year. And, and yeah. so how did you you eventually it was cleared and they pushed it back to 1992 that you would have the, the postseason ban. But like, how do you that, that there was no Twitter then there was no Internet then there yeah. was no Facebook. There was no like uh, the, the, the news cycle was very different. So how are mm -hmm. how are you following that? How, how are you keeping up to date on all of that information at that time? And how stressful is it not knowing if you're going to have a chance to defend that title? Well, you know, it, it, there is a level of stress, but not overly significant. And, and it really started the year we won it because, you know, you, you, you mentioned our start where we lost a few games early. Part of that was also we uh, we didn't have our whole team. They were suspending two of our players for every game. Uh, I think the first eight games of the season or, or seven games until because we, we had issues, I guess. And I, I got I had to send out a game. Larry and Stacy had to send out multiple games. And so and we didn't know who was out until right before tip. You know, just things kind of functioned differently back then. You didn't have the level of scrutiny that you might have today and you didn't have the whole woke culture. Right. So yeah. the narrative as a player or a program, you couldn't control back then. You didn't have a chance to really put your words out there. And so. All we could rely upon was our coach and, you know, our AD, uh, Dr. Rothermill, and, and then obviously Coach Tark and our coaching staff, and they kept assuring us everything's going to be fine. Uh, and quite frankly, a lot of things might have changed. You know, we might have all turned pro earlier had we thought that uh, we, we wouldn't have an opportunity to to defend the title. So, yeah, you, you dealt with a lot of that stuff, man, And it, but that was kind of par for the course. Coach had always had issues with the with the NCAA going all the way back to when he was at Long Beach State. And and so uh, th that's just kind of the nature of the beast. And we all knew that when we signed up that you might deal with some element of that from the NCAA because, you know, he wasn't one of the golden boys. He wasn't a blue blood program. Uh, and he in a lot of ways, he went against the norm. And so 
that was a bit challenging, but fortunately for us, uh, it didn't have a huge impact on us having the opportunity to uh, defend that national championship. And so for our senior year, up until obviously the final four, it it was a crazy ride. Yeah. So you enter the final four with an undefeated record. And I think that you guys probably know as well as anybody what Gonzaga is going through right now. I mean, it, the similarities are, are are pretty stark to me. Like you guys both come from a conference outside of the power structure. You both uh, enter the NCAA tournament with an undefeated record. You both are loaded with NBA players on that roster where anybody that knows anything about basketball can understand, okay, these guys are going to be awesome. So what what is Gonzaga going through right now entering into a tournament where you have that that weight of – an undefeated season hanging over your head. Like what, what were you guys experiencing then? Was there anything extra added to it? Uh, well, the, you know, there are a lot of similarities to your point, but then there are some distinct differences. We, we were defending national champs mm-hmm. first and foremost. And so that, that creates a different dynamic for you. Uh, now there are, there are a lot of similarities too. Like you said, they've been a dominant team all year long, much like we were our senior year. Uh, they've got great balance. Uh, they're efficient and, and, and great on both sides. They've got a, a future Hall of Fame coach. Um, they got a lot of positives going for them. Um, and we also had a better, I think what helped us too is in some respects, we had a better sense of the landscape, meaning, you know, because of the COVID and all the things and all the uncertainty that have gone on, sometimes it's harder to get a truer sense of who's going to be really good. Right. Because the schedules have been so chaotic and you've had suspensions and cancellations and all these other things that play a role. And you're having to make games, you know, next week uh, to fill a spot on the schedule. So they, they've got a lot that they're dealing with. Um, and honestly, it might help them. Uh, whereas in our case, we had to deal with constantly answering the questions of, you know, are we one of the best teams ever? You know, uh, we were the defending champs. We were dealing with the NCAA. So, like, we we had a lot of other stuff that we were dealing with uh, that, fortunately for them, they don't. Uh, and, and so I, I do think that their opportunities are going to be there for them. They're a, an incredibly good team. And I, and I, I know Coach Few pretty well. My wife's from Spokane, Washington. Uh, so we spent a lot of time in that area. Uh, they recruited my son as well. And, and and I just know how wonderful of a person and coach he is and how great the program is. And so I'm, you know, I'm pulling for them. Uh, and I think they have a great opportunity uh, to kind of shock the world. Now, the, the one thing that always concerns you when you're undefeated is you've in the tournament, you've got to be able to win games when you don't play well. You know, we had a couple uh, both years, uh, we, we had a, a, a one possession game that we won against Ball State, and we had a one possession game that we lost against against Duke. And, and in those games, we didn't play as well as we were capable of. You've got to give some credit to the opponent as well. Uh, and so they're going to have to try to avoid that. And listen, they did a great job of their last game out against BYU in, in the, in the uh, conference tournament where BYU was kind of giving it to them there, but they were able to overcome. Uh, I, I'm anxious to see how this thing plays out, man, because unfortunately with all that's happened this year, a lot of people haven't seen Gonzaga, you know, play consistently, right? Those I'm on the East coast. Those games are tipping at 10, 10, 30 oftentimes. And so it's hard for everybody nationally to have a good perspective of them. Uh, but yeah, you're right. They're, they're going to be the team that has the bullseye on their back moving forward. Uh, they're incredibly well coached. They have a tremendous amount of talent, but they also have a lot of experience, which I think uh, was similar to what we had. Uh, they were a really good team a year ago. Uh, and, and then they bring in a kid that's going to be a lottery pick uh, to go with all the other talent that they have and experience. And I tell you, they're just a, a juggernaut on both ends. I, I don't know that there's an answer of how to beat them if they play well. Yep. And I know we got to get you out of here. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. This is the last question I got for you guys, along with, you know, I think the fab five and the flying Illini and teams of the era kind of ushered in um, a new culture in basketball, so to speak. I feel like you guys were something of a movement, right? Like th- there's the video where Tupac wore the UNLV Jersey and Gucci row and all that stuff. So, um, and you also had the, the whole ideal of, you know, we're going to give the middle finger to the NCAA and everything that Tark brought with it. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like that's a m- lot more pervasive in kind of the, the college sports space now. So um, I'm curious, like, what do you think the legacy is of that UNLV team beyond just being like, maybe we're the greatest team ever, maybe not. Like, what, what do you think the legacy that that program and that team left? 
Well, in a lot of ways, to your point, uh, I think we we kind of started what we're experiencing now in terms of self empowerment, uh, in terms of understanding your value and your power uh, as an individual. Uh, you know, we have all this everybody being woke now uh, and understanding uh, the value of being a student athlete. You know, I think you know a lot of ways Fab Five came after us but they learned a lot, you know, Anderson Hunt uh, and, and Jalen Rose went to the same high school. We spent a lot of time around those guys. We knew Chris Weber, Chris Weber wore number his number in college because of Larry Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, you know, it's an evolution. Um, we had our issues with the NCAA as did they. Uh, but now you look at it where the players now truly do have power. They have a sense of worth. You see it in professional sports as well. And, a lot of that started back when we played. Uh, I remember, for me, I was a I was a walk on my senior year. I was all American, but because I had started my own business uh, and, and was doing really well, the NCAA told me why well, I couldn't work and have my scholarship. So I told Coach, "Hey, look, I'm an in-state student. I'm doing well. I'll, I'll pay my own way through college. Uh, and why don't you give that scholarship to another guy?" And so that kind of thought process. You didn't see a lot of uh, prior to, but now you're starting to see guys understand what their true value is and also understanding they have the opportunity to control their narrative and be able to show and tell their story as opposed to having it done for them. Uh, and I think you're starting to see more and more of that moving forward, especially in our society with how things are kind of developing and evolving. So we felt like we were kind of at the forefront. We were rebels, if you will. Uh, and not in a negative way, but we felt like, you know, we were individuals that were not necessarily given their fair share in terms of who we were. Like we, we couldn't express ourselves. Like people didn't know that I was a really good student because I wore run a rebel uniform. You know, we, we were just starting to push that narrative out and, and let people know who we were. Uh, and we did it with attitude on the court. So, you know, we were real proud of what we accomplished there. And it's great to see where we are now, where there is far more awareness of the student athlete. And now the student athletes have an opportunity to take advantage of their hard work uh, and, and the opportunities that their talents have created. Well, listen, Greg, I appreciate the time. I know you got a lot going on. It's March. Everybody's busy right now. So uh, thank you so much. All right. My pleasure, man. Good luck with everything.